and almost a trillion of it is in these anti-poverty programs. So we have a bit, lot of work to do, but we do it through three programs and it, there, it's effective, I must say. We have a clergy center, a, a media center, and a policy center to get the government out of welfare. Absolutely. Uh, I see that our webinar is now live on Facebook. We were having some technical difficulties earlier. So for those of us who are just tuning in, this is Star Parker, the founder and president of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, a Washington, D.C.-based public policy institute. She's also authored many books, the most recent of which is about Donald Trump and the culture wars. So you just mentioned that uh, the government isn't very good at anti-poverty work, despite the fact that we spend trillions of dollars on this project. I suppose it's a bit of an obvious question, but why hasn't it worked yet? It hasn't worked because people are individually made. We're unique. We're not one size fits all. And so when you think about government programming, it's one size fits all. In fact, I used to live on welfare. I don't know how much you know about my story and why I do what I do today, why I'm compelled. Uh, and it's my mission in life to get the government out of anti-poverty is because I believed all the lies of the left. A lot of the lies we're hearing today, you're probably hearing them in your state right now, uh, that my problems are somebody else's fault, that America's so racist, I shouldn't mainstream, that I'm poor because others are wealthy. And when you start building this into your belief system, you start living very recklessly. You start making decisions decisions that we're seeing today. I was doing all of those things then. Criminal activity by the time I was 12, drug activity by 14, uh, sexual activity by 16, anything I could do I was doing in and out of abortion clinic after clinic, then on welfare. And after a Christian conversion, I totally changed my life. Got a degree, I went to you know, college, got a degree, uh, went into business. And after the 92 Los Angeles riots destroyed my business, I began to focus on social reform, began to focus on welfare reform, began to focus on what did actually break down, which is your question. What broke down is that charity doesn't belong in Washington. It doesn't belong in a one size fits all government program. Did you know that of that 900 billion that we spend every year on anti-poverty programs, that less than 20 cent on a dollar actually reaches the households that we're trying to yeah, I mean, it's really bad. The rest where is just, does the money go? How does it evaporate like that? Oh, it's evaporated. That's why when Donald Trump got here, he found out that this swamp is really deep. It is a swamp. It's a lot of energy behind keeping the status quo. Um, but at the, the end of the day, the people that we really want to help, and I do believe that many Americans really want to help those that 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 are struggling, that have uh, vulnerabilities, uh, but you can't do that in a government system. You have to do it very personally because we are very uniquely made. Absolutely. All good points. I totally agree with you. Uh, not to go down too much of a tangent or a rabbit hole here, but you mentioned that you had a business destroyed in the 92 riots. You know, we're from the Minneapolis area here at Alpha News, so we're very interested in stories about riots. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it was some of the same things that we're hearing today, that um, people were discouraged because of a decision that was made on, uh, regarding police brutality, and they felt the same way we're hearing today, that their cause should be everybody's cause, so they force everybody into their cause. Look, it's not that police brutality or over-police and aggressive policing shouldn't be a cause, uh, because there are challenges, but if those challenges are something that you want to personally fix, like we all have things that we want to personally fix, then you go fix it. You go look for solutions to it. You don't force a society to come in with you. You don't shake people down and intimidate them with KKK tactics. You work on them, you fix them. And when you really think about uh, the challenges in over, uh, aggressive policing, it boils down to union. That's what happened there. That's what happened in Los Angeles during the Rodney King rioting. Uh, we were seeing the same thing. The unions do protect their police officers, even when they're rogue police officers. And so you have to work through that scenario where you have unionized police officers. Those are very local issues. This is not something the rest of the country can help you fix. You got to do that yourself in your local area. So what happened in Los Angeles is Rodney King got beat up by some police officers. They were acquitted and people were mad at the rest of the rest of us. And so they burned the whole city down. Uh, and as a result, my business didn't get burned down, but it sure was affected by all of the rioting. And so that's when I transitioned into my focus on welfare reform and, um, and the work I do here in Washington. Because when the dust settles and it will settle again, I know that you're going through the challenge right now. And it's very, very difficult what uh, the hard left and the BLM are doing to our, our society to try to destabilize us. But once it does settle, what we're going to find out 
is the disproportionate number of people that just don't believe they have a stake in America that we're doing the absolute rioting. Where we see health in our communities, especially in the black community, where we see husbands married to the mother of the children in the black community, and you see husbands married to the mother of the children in the white community, we can't even measure the economic differences. We don't see the pathology. This is my work here in Washington. We can't measure economics. We can't measure educational crime, drugs, all of these things, because there are so many similarities in the values. What's broken down in our most hard hit pocketed zip codes is the value structure because family's broken down. So what we're going to find out is the disproportionate number of people that didn't have family uh, associated attached to their lives were out there beating up other people and burning down their properties. And then we'll have to fix that. But yeah, that's a long answer to your short question, but it's the same thing that happened in the 90s that we're seeing today. No, it's a fantastic answer. People that don't have accountability to their family or don't feel like they have a stake in, you know, the nation of America are more likely to lash out violently when things get rough. It's an excellent point. Uh, what sort of steps would you recommend and what sort of steps is your institution taking to try to instill that sense of family and belonging in American community? Well, one of the things that we did is start, try to talk to the 12 year old and the 14 year old that's getting caught up in this new uh, uh, um, dismantling of our society and the destabilization going on. So we did a billboard campaign that BLM came after uh, and made Clear Channel Outdoor breach their contract with us and take them down. But we wanted to talk directly to those that are just getting caught up in the action that are getting caught up in the confusion because make no mistake, what does make this opportunity very different from what happened in the 90s is you have an outside force that is not from the broken family. These are the affluent, the kids of the affluent that really believe in Marxism. They do not think that we should have individual uniqueness, that we should buy ideas of collectivism, and that we should have a political system uh, that is of collectivist and totalitarianism, and that we should have an economic system of socialism. And they're going to do anything. They're going to look for any and every opportunity. So what they did is they latched on to the death of George Floyd to use this as an opportunity to go out there and destabilize the whole society. They're bringing with them now those that are just vulnerable and have no clue about uh, how they're going to fix their lives. You know, what's really fascinating, Kyle, is these are the very people that then fight real opportunity for change in these communities. They're the ones that do fight to keep union status quo. They're the ones that, that fight even for the teachers unions to control the schools and not allow money to follow children to schools parents may want. They're the ones that don't want any type of capitalistic a system that actually rewards good choices. Uh, so, you know, it's really fascinating what's going on. And that's the reason that the president is so adamant that we need a real rule of law. This is what our constitution is about. It's about truth. It's about a rule of law. It's about a civil society. And so that's what's at stake in this next election. Uh, once he wins this next election, uh, then we'll start seeing it settle down after, of course, they have their temper tantrum of peaceful protest on uh, one more round. You know, what you're saying is so absolutely true about the role that these uh, sort of university educated Marxists play in the riots today. I've been at the riots in Minneapolis. And when you go down there, you see this class of sort of you know, forgive they're not my riots, they're peaceful protests. They can't <laughs> a new book. No, we got to rename them peaceful protests. <laughs> the, the fiery, but mostly the peaceful. fiery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you go down there, you Passionate know. peaceful protests. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You know the riot. <laughs> You see these, you see these sort of uppity liberal white kids from the University of Minnesota, from colleges, and they're out there with Antifa holding their Marxist signs and citing this violence, and they're sort of co-opting this other movement that you see about, you know, these people that are concerned with George Floyd, and they're stoking the violence, and they're involving people in their Marxist cause, and it's, it's really disgusting the role that these, I'll say, you know, privileged white kids play in, in in furthering the situation. Well, but wait a minute now. Don't forget now. The the African Americans are doing well too. You have now a quarter of African Americans that are in the upper middle class. So their kids are out there too. This is not they're they're mixed. This is uh this is uh Marxism from the colleges and those that are privileged come in all ethnicities. But you're absolutely right. I actually took pictures of when the peaceful protesters came here to destroy our nation's capital. And I actually not only did I take pictures, then I started pulling assessing their garb, what they were wearing because I I'm like a fashionista. I kind of like the the um, uh, designers, and so I. I broke it down even for a group of friends of mine, how much money they're wearing just that day. Uh, we're talking $7,000. I mean, a, 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 a Rick 
own jacket, for instance, is going to cost you a couple of grand just that alone. And then we start getting down to the boots and the belt. Uh, and don't forget the Tom Ford glasses and the cologne. Uh, you were, you're right. They're the elite. And they were out of school. And they had nothing else to do with their time. So they thought a good time to go out and try to see if they could sell on society what hasn't worked all around the world. And it's not going to work here either, because we are free people in this country. And uh, most of us do not want to live under the dictates of somebody else. And I think that the liberals are going to find out the hard way uh, that they shouldn't have gone this one step too far because they've exposed themselves to middle America. Middle America is going to reject this madness. Yeah, you've got the million dollar Marxists butting up against the middle America. What's yeah. your prediction? How do you think middle America is going to respond? I think that the suburbanites are watching, all of them, all ethnicities, even the 40% of black folks that live in the suburbs are watching this. The ones whose kids are not out in the streets, they're sitting in the backyard uh, because we're supposed to be under COVID alert. Uh, so yeah, I think that most people are wondering why peaceful protesters were able to go out in the streets in the first place. If you were upset about George Floyd, that pain was your own. Stay inside like the rest of us. Everybody gave up their First Amendment right so that we can get a handle on that uh, disease that they told us was going to kill off the whole society as a result of the peaceful protesters being able to go outside because now they're all mad and they want to vent in the public uh everything has unraveled but it is a clear picture as we go into the voting booth and i don't care what the media is telling us about the polling data when you start looking at the heart of america and the heartland of america law and order is what we want peace yeah. is what we want and that is not what the other side is offering at all Absolutely, absolutely. So you're fairly confident that President Trump's going to win on November 3rd. You recently authored a book, Necessary Noise, How Donald Trump Inflames the Culture Wars and Why This is Good News for America. This is a nice segue into talking about this book. Uh, what do you mean by culture wars? How is Trump inflaming them and how is that good for America? Well, in the book, I look at five areas to where we have been intensifying, moving to that place like in the 1850s to where you, you just finally can't go on anymore. You got to make a decision. Uh, are we going to be free or are we going to be secular in status? And that's the pulse point where we are. Uh, so I look at history a little bit in the book, and then I find five areas that uh, this book is for the person that is saying, well, maybe, I'm just not sure. I don't like his personality. I don't know what's really at stake. What's at stake is principle and purpose. And what we need to do is find that. What is it that we believe in why in our uniqueness? And so I look at five different places that I think people should be concerned uh, and they can pick one and then pick someone. If there's nothing else that Joe Biden has told us about that that's coherent about what's going on in his mind, it is that this election is about the heart and soul of America. And it is, it is absolutely true. So it just depends on which America we want to be in the public square. Uh, and that's what the book is about. So uh, it has a, uh, a Christian element. I'm writing it more for that evangelical who still doesn't think that they should be engaged uh, because as long as they sit out, the world gets darker uh, and we need to not be so dark. I think that what the left has done this summer is showed us where we will go as a society if we have a Biden-Harris win. Every time something doesn't go their way, this is that we will have a temper tantrum. We will have a peaceful protest. This is the 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 strategy of not just the KKK, but this is Al Qaeda. So we need to be mindful that very quickly we can unravel as a civil society if a Biden-Harris ticket. Uh, becomes the the leading um, uh, presidential, it becomes the candidates for us yeah. or the president for us. Absolutely. And this touches on an ongoing discussion we've had on the show, and that is what our guests predict will happen if Biden-Harris is successful in uh, taking the White House. Uh, we've had some guests that say that the left will stand down and the mostly peaceful rioters will go home. And we've had other guests that posit that uh, a Biden-Harris presidency would only embolden the violent actors to perpetuate further chaos. What are your thoughts? I think I would go with the latter because what happens when your two-year-old decides that they're going to run the house? They don't simmer down when you give them candy. They get louder and they get more emboldened. And then as they age, they become much more demanding. Now, if Biden and Harris uh, were to win, their, their, their temper tantrums will demand everything and, and everything right now. Well, that's not how Washington works. What will happen immediately if they were to win is Washington will be overrun by lobbyists because everyone 
anyone that has any kind of interest in any area that they keep saying they're going to destroy will be here to try to protect those interests. So what you're going to constantly have is a combative environment because our government is three part. Our government is not one of dictator. Our government, and you know, even those accusations that that's what Trump is trying to do, that's not even true. I mean, he does do a lot of executive orders, but it's a three part government. We know that. And that's how Washington works. Policy making is very different from politics. And when you think about policy making, it, it, it is organized. And this temper tantrum crowd doesn't like organization at all. We have seen the results in many a city. Some won't come back. I feel very sorry for Portland. Uh, Seattle will probably come back because it has a lot of money there that uh, the taxes can come through and maybe rebuild themselves. But some cities are going to struggle their way back. Even over there in Minneapolis, I'm very concerned because when you think about the, 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 the smaller business, when a smaller business uh, develops out of a community, uh, they don't come back as readily as having a Boeing or a, a Amazon or, you know, some things that they have up there in, in Seattle. And we know that also from the 60s. There are places that never came back. People think Watts was always a ghetto. That's not true. It was actually thriving and it never came back. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you look at the uptown area of Minneapolis, you've got all these one-off boutique businesses that can't transfer in assets from somewhere else to rebuild. They're 100% reliant on that physical location. That's, right. That's compromised, it's over. You know, Target Corporation, sure, they can rebuild their stores, thankfully. But your mom and pop clothing store, your small grocer, your one-off gas station, one riot and that's it that business and target can't rebuild either if people aren't there that can go and and support that we saw that when the peaceful protesters came through here in washington dc uh there are three particular communities that have just grown up in the last 10 years that were incredibly vibrant and it doesn't look like one in particular is going to be able to come back because it's still boarded up because these peaceful protesters keep coming back with their peace and um and, and, and just might not um, might not survive, which then trickles into that means the apartments won't be full and the apartments aren't full, then, they, then the rents fall and if the rents start to fall, then the area starts to uh, deteriorate. So uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's not just that small business who may not be able to come back, but when you have a major uh, box store that's competing with boxes going in the mail uh, to say, do I still keep myself established here when there's no family life here to come in, into my store? Uh, it'll be a hard time to recover. So I'm hoping that we have a very effective election to get us back on track for the beauty of our country, the principles of the Christianity, the, the, the virtues of the capitalism, the rule of law of our constitution so that we can recover ourselves. Uh, and in a short order, we'll be able to get things back on track even though it was a very, very hard 2020. A hard 2020 indeed. Uh, for those of us who are just tuning in, we're on the line with Star Parker, the founder and president of the Center for Urban Renewal and Education, a Washington, D.C.-based public policy institute that fights poverty and restores dignity through messages of faith, freedom, and personal responsibility. She's also an author of many books, the most recent of which is Necessary Noise, How Trump Inflames the Culture Wars and Why This is Good for America. In your last response, you mentioned faith, and you know that's something that's central to your organization, and we haven't necessarily discussed it yet. What do you think the role of faith in American politics is right now, and what's your prediction for the future of Christianity in this country? Well, since Christianity is personal, I think that it will survive regardless of what happens in the political world. And unfortunately, so many Christians believe that, that they're not engaged in the political world. And the challenge with that particular attitude is life gets really hard in the public square, in particular for the most vulnerable. So it is important that even those that say, I'll be okay, because I live my life for eternity, uh, it, it, they, they have a, an opportunity here to engage themselves because that's what the founders knew is the right thing to do. In order to have a civil society, we have to have a moral society. And so the role of the church is incredibly important. But that said, it's nothing to do with what we do here in Washington, DC. It's one of the mistakes of that faith-based initiative that, that Bush uh, brought here. What we want is a limited role of government. The reason we have so much tension in our society today is because we're forced into spaces that we shouldn't be together. When it comes to children, for instance, it, money should follow children to schools parents want. All of the tensions will go away, between whether it's critical race theory or whether it's multiculturalism, for in fact, whatever it is you want to teach your children, do it in your private 
personal choices as opposed to lumping all kids into one classroom situation. When you think about even the dismantling of the social security system, which is urgently needed for us as a society, because then money goes to IRAs instead of to the IRS. So when you have a stake in Wall Street, you're not going to burn down Wall Street. So there are many things that we can do driven by our personal faith to make sure that we have a civil society. But that means limiting the role of government. In essence, Christianity is just personal responsibility. It's self-governing. We're going to govern ourselves or we're going to be governed by a king. And it sounds like the left wants us governed by a king. And I think that Christianity says, you know, we, 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 can, we got this. We can figure it out. And even if we don't, we have an advocate who died for our sins and give us a fresh start the next day. So yeah, I'm very, very um, confident that Christianity will survive and survive this long. And it's been persecuted a lot harder than what we're dealing with right now. Uh, but I do want to fight to win one more war. Yeah, the Romans were a lot harder on Christianity than the Democrats could ever be. And we <laughs> well, I don't know how it could ever be now because they, they've been saying some interesting things. And if they get some power, we don't want to find out exactly where they will go. Uh, if, if, if a glimpse into what they have in store was what happened when we all walked out of the White House after the president accepted the nomination for the GOP, if that was just one glimpse, we better stop these guys because it was really ugly. It was really ugly. How do we get to this point where it's so ugly, though? Because I feel like America started out as a relatively, you know, Christian valued nation that, you know, uh, placed emphasis on personal responsibility. And now we seem to be lacking that. What happened in between? Well, I think a few things happen. One is we allowed government to get in places that it shouldn't. One area is in education. We forced ourselves into one situation and now you got to fight for what values will uh, be dominant in there. Uh, and we had Christian values that were dominant in our public spaces. And so then we had in the 60s, a scrubbing of our schools. Then what else happened was you had a collapse of marriage because the feminist movement decided that not just do we want a little bit of freedom, a little bit more uh, opportunity to self-govern and make choices, but they want to take a one step further and just dismantle in major institutions like marriage. Fast forward, not only now do you not have heterosexual marriage, you got homosexual marriage. And so, uh, so this has uh, increased the tensions when it comes to culture and cultural war. And then on top of that, we put a welfare state and said, don't worry about any natural consequences that may come from any decisions that you make, because now we have situational ethics. Since we have no religious absolute truth that we all Belief is true well, according to our even constitutional founding. But when you have situational ethics, you're going to do whatever you want to do. Uh, we then developed out safety nets. It became in vogue to steal from your neighbor. And so now we steal at such a level that 60% of Americans get more from government than they put in. What we have to do is start decreasing that relationship. You got to start self-governing. I'm okay. You do your thing. You go for, work it out, work out your own salvation, but don't force me into those decisions. So that's how we look at it here at Cures, the dismantling that needs to play, take, take place so that we can live free. So you can really live free your choices. I can live free my choices. And, um, and, and I'm not forced into your life and you're not forced into mine. Absolutely. You know, it's fantastic. You keep hitting on these recurring themes that we've talked about on the show, and you did it again with situational ethics. And this is something that I've been very concerned with, and a lot of our other guests have been very concerned with, is the deterioration of objective morality and objective standards. Because nowadays, people seem to believe that what's right and what's wrong is dependent more on what's happening, what the circumstances are, what your feelings are, and less so on objective truth, which right. is something that Christianity and conservatism holds very dear. So thank you so much for bringing that you're, up. You're, you're absolutely right. And if I can add to that, is that so instead what God then becomes replaced by government. And so now we, we ask the politician to define morality. Mm -hmm. That is not a healthy place to be. Well, right. let's, if we're going to work out our salvation, we're going to argue with anybody, let's argue with God, because at least that's on a personal level. And he's not going to now go and clobber us like what we're hearing out of those that think government should determine uh, our every choice in our lives. I mean, look at some of the cases that are going to the courts. That's, it's just crazy. Look at the role of the court and how busy they have become because government has replaced uh, God, uh, which encourages personal responsibility, self government. You have to have a, an absolute truth if you're, so that we know where the bar is so that then we can play in the yard freely.
Yeah, I mean, does anybody want the Ninth Circuit Court or politicians like Nancy Pelosi or Jerry Nadler making decisions about what's right for their family? I, I really don't understand how that makes any sense to anybody. It's, it's absurd. Um, and even for the poor, it gets worse. They just, I mean, now we're having debates about even what kind of businesses can open and what can, in which zip codes. It's just really crazy uh, the, the extent that they will go with their agenda. So yeah, we want that very, very limited. So God plays a role in that because you have to have someone you appeal to to say, this is right, this is wrong, this is good, this is evil. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Elephant in the room topic here, I feel like we have to address the debates because we had one just last night. What are your thoughts on how these debates are going and you know how the campaigns are going more broadly? Well, the first debate, we had a lot of popcorn and fun. Uh, last night's debate was a little more serious. And so we, I, I hope that the numbers were high. I, hadn't, I haven't seen them yet for how well uh, viewed the debate was because they got into some serious matters to point a, a clear picture, especially the vice president showed a clear picture of what is at stake. So anyone that's gonna go into that voting booth uh, and vote for the left, they understand exactly what they're voting for. They're voting for abortion. They're voting for redistribution. They're, you know, it's interesting, it's fascinating even that the same God, the same coin, the same command that says don't kill, says don't steal. That, the, the sanctity of property is just as sacred as the sanctity of life. So anyone that would vote for the left is voting against the very values of the Ten Commandments. And I think it couldn't have been more clear last night. So not a whole lot of popcorn eating, a whole mo lot more listening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you characterize the left as a force that wants dependency, that wants control over people, that has instituted the welfare state to maintain that dependent relationship. Uh, but why do, you, why, why do you think they're motivated to do these things? What's the, what's the underlying ethos behind this decision to have the welfare state? Well, Lord Acton told us power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and people like corruption. I mean, let's face it, there's an excitement in corruption, in evil, in, 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 in the uncertainty, the unknown. Uh, there's an excitement there. These guys that are out firebombing, look, they're not even thinking. They're like two-year-olds who jump in swimming pools. They don't know what water is. They don't know they don't know how to swim. They light fires under buildings that have 300 people upstairs sleeping. But the fire is exciting. So corruption, yeah, you're not going to get away from it. And the more powerful you are because of your financial place, the next stage is power. You've got to have that. There's a thrill that comes with being able to govern over others. And that's why our founders were so brilliant in saying, we know that. We believe that part of the scripture that says the heart of man is deceitful above all and desperately wicked and will do anything. So we have to check and balance it. And that's what they attempted to do. But sure, people are going to try to slip under that and slip through that because power is exciting. Mm -hmm. I work here in Washington and I'll tell you, it's an interesting place. Power is intriguing. It's exciting. It's luring. Um, but at the, in the end, it's death. In the end, it's death. It's death for someone. If it's not that individual, the controlling over somebody else's life, we can look any and everywhere and see the damage of what happens when you have totalitarian government in charge. We don't even have to go to Cuba to see socialism. We can go to Compton. We can go to Camden. We can go to any inner city in this country and see what happens when you leash people and you hold down their potential thinking that you have all of the answers for their lives. They become very desperate. They become very demanding. And then the next thing you know, we have, well, peaceful protest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my favorite political commentators once said that uh, all politics is really about death. If you look at it long enough, it's really about the power to control the ultimate outcomes of people's lives. That's why we see so much focus on abortion, on war, on these grave issues of, you know, human life. And it, it, it's really it's really disturbing to watch this play out with people that seem to be drunk on the idea of power. Um, and news follows it. So yeah. that's why you see that intrigue together. That's why they, they, they work very closely together. And you're, you're outside uh, when you decide that you are looking for truth in news. That's not what reporting has become. That fourth estate is, is driven now by the politics itself and the lure to be able to be invited to the uh, grand events, including the Washington Correspondent Dinner. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, what is it? Violence sells papers and uh, it gets reporters a long way in the world. Uh, <laughs> something you brought up earlier in this interview that I want to circle back to uh, is this issue of social security. Uh, I've never really thought too deeply about the issue of social security, but I think you mentioned that it needs to be seriously reformed. Could you explain your position there just a little bit? 
Well, I don't know that it needs to be seriously reformed. I think it needs to be seriously dismantled. It's where we got off track. Once you allow government to come in and said, I can socialize you, you mm -hmm. know, I can secure you through this one size fits all, everybody pay, and then we'll pick winners and losers on the other end. It opened the door for the entire welfare state. If you look at it, Social Security, once it was started, next thing you know, we had a welfare state. Next thing you know, we had Medicare, then we had Medicaid. All of these things are new. Then we had a Department of Education start tracking it. But at the end of the day, what is it that we're trying to solve? What is the problem that we say we're trying to solve to have a social security system? We didn't want people to die alone. We didn't want them to age and die alone for. So as a society, we said, you know, maybe we should come up with some kind of system so that people won't die alone, aging, poor. Did we go down the right track to say government should do this? I don't think so. I think that what we ought to do is allow people, if you're going to say you contribute a little bit and your boss is going to contribute a little bit, I don't think that the black hole should be government. I think that we should put it in an IRA, put it in a 401k. Why should we have the boss send 6.2%, have the employee send 0.2% into an account at the IRS that the Supreme Court has ruled twice is simply a tax that you do not own it, you cannot transfer it. You get a horrible rate of return on it. This is not a system for, especially not poor people, because every generation just starts over. You want to stop the rioting, I mean, the peaceful protests all across the country, then personalize Social Security, because now all of a sudden everybody owns all of those businesses. You're not going to burn them down. It's kind of like what, well, we have debate here in my think tank about who said it first, Lawrence uh, Summers or or uh, Phil Graham. But the, the, the statement is, I've never seen a man wash a rented car. It's true. You That's don't cool. wash a rented car, but you wash your car. So if you own Wall Street, you don't burn down Wall Street. And so Social Security is very, very important to reform because you get rid of that wealth gap. You get rid of that net worth gap. All of these things solve in one generation by being able to transfer wealth. The data has been done. One of the uh, places that's done extensive research in this uh, is Cato Institute that see that all of what would have happened had people been able to over the last 40 years put that money in the IRA instead of the IRS. We'd have a very, very wealthy society today, including those that are in our most vulnerable situations uh, with broken family, broken school, broken everything else. They'd have a, a security in their future because they own a future. That's a very good point. You know, I'm very concerned with the, the future of elderly people, especially as you see the family deteriorate. Unfortunately, hopefully we can fix that situation a little bit. But I see what you're saying about how there's more benefit to privatizing this process and allowing people to invest in investment vehicles they can actually control and manipulate and that they get a reasonable rate of return on. I see what you're right, saying. Right, right. And, and, and the challenge is everyone else in society actually gets to do a little bit of it, except the poor. The poor are the only ones that are forced to put their money in. The only little bit that they may have have to save into that little dark hole. So when President Bush was here and he was thinking to reform, uh, we were at the table trying to get him to let everybody under 30,000 put that money into an IRA account. Imagine had that happened. He's been gone here, what, now 20 years? Imagine 20 years ago that people were now building wealth, building net worth. I think that we'd have a very different scenario about what the complaints are coming out of our most vulnerable communities. But I'm not, um, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that it will still happen, especially now now that the new data is coming out since the president uh, reduced taxation and, and regulation over business and flourished the economy, we saw one chart in Black America flip. And that is the chart that now we have more in the upper middle class than we have in the bottom class. And that is the first time in the history of the country that we're now looking at almost 30% of African-Americans in this country making uh, 75,000 or more income. They're in the upper middle class. So we already knew that 75% were in the middle class, but this is good news that now we have a smaller, impoverished, entrenched community that we have more availability to work on. You release this group and allow them to start gaining monies through personalizing social security, all of a sudden the playing field is equalized overnight. And that's why it's fascinating that the left fights that one too. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's anybody that should be allowed to make smarter investment decisions, it's those people that have relatively less to invest. It seems sense. It, yeah, yeah, it seems so. Now, why do they keep electing officials that disagree with all of these things that would really help their lives is another question for another show, I suppose. But yeah, you would. Um, that's one um, light in this dark tunnel that we've been in that I hope that we will see. And that is more people rethink who is going to lead them in these most hard hit communities. Because Black Lives Matters has put some ideas on the table that are making a whole lot of people stay up 
all night. And as a result of that, those people that are staying up all night are also well entrenched black middle class and accomplished African Americans who for a long time bought the liberal lie. And now they're starting to see the result and say, I'm not sure that this is where I intended for us to go. Mm -hmm. One of my last questions for you here, who do you predict will emerge as the leaders of those communities in coming years? Well, that's not something that I can do because our leaders are elected. We have different types of leadership. We have pastors that I'm hoping will start taking a more effective leadership role in their communities to help revitalize communities. Uh, we have legislators who they elect, and I'm hoping that now they start getting a sense of <laughs> that the, the role that the liberal le legislators have been playing and maybe boot them out. Um, but, but leaders are selected you know, from from below. And this is something that uh, the people of that community have to do. Um, what has happened to make that more difficult is that they shut out the other side of the debate. This is a new phenomenon in Black America to where the Black conservative is not even welcome to the table to even debate, to even have the discussions that need to, to happen. This is very new. Up until the 60s, we would have all sides at the table. And even though liberals would, uh, you know, in the end, uh, get their way, and especially when it came to be, becoming the elected officials because of the civil rights movement. But that has never been uh, in African American uh, communities to where those that disagree with the, with the narrative are totally shut out of the discussions, even at their own family reunions and funerals. Yeah, a very, very, very disturbing trend indeed. Um, Looks like we're kind of coming down to the end of our time here. It's been a fascinating discussion, fascinating conversation. If people want to keep up with you, your work, your organization, how should they do that? Well, they go to my name, Star Parker. I'm sure they'll find Urban Cure. They'll probably find a Twitter. They'll find a Facebook. We do it all. We do it all. And I just launched my own show. I have my own show that we just launched uh, called Cure America with Star Parker. So it's a deeper dive, an hour long discussion into issues, kind of like what you're doing here. Uh, but we have a panel and all that kind of stuff as well. But yeah, if they put in Star Parker, they're going to find me. And I appreciate it because we're a 501c3. So people that are generous to us, we can be generous to the rest of the population. Fantastic. Are you running that show on Facebook like this one? I think I think it's on Facebook too. You know what? I'm so not techie that I think it's we have we have we own our own um, blackcommunitynews.com. We have a full media house, so we have blackcommunitynews.com, so we can really push it into our clergy um, network. But we also have the Facebook. It goes up there, and we have the Twitter. We have the YouTube. They have a YouTube. Yep, yep. They have all of that. We have it. Absolutely. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, absolutely. why are you asking me? Now you're showing your audience that I'm clueless about where I'm going right now. All I know is if you put my name in, then pick, make your pick which one you like the best. You want to Twitter it? There it is. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, you should absolutely do that. Uh, look up Star Parker, follow the YouTube, Facebook, uh, check out Star Parker, the, uh, the cure, urbancure.org, all fantastic resources. Hey, thank you so much for being with us today. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. One quick note before we shut down the stream, we're going to be back at 6.30 with Gordon Chang, one of America's foremost experts on China and the author of The Great U.S.-China, Tech War and Losing South Korea. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in, and we'll be back at 6.30 and hope to see you again this evening.